we have been doing a topical study, which normally it's expositional, but every so often we do something topical. And we've been looking at various characters in the scriptures and considering them. Last week was a different message, but prior to that we were considering Mary was the last one we dealt with. So we we dealt with ten in the Old Testament. We're only going to do, unless the Lord brings something else to mind, but maybe next week we'll, we'll bring this series to a close as we will look at the Apostle Paul. But we're looking today at Peter. We'll be considering Peter here this morning. And then you pray for us as we look to the future and what the Lord would have us to consider in coming days. But we're going to read from John chapter 1, verse 35. John 1, verse 35. Again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is, being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is, by interpretation, a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Amen. Ending our reading at verse 44. May God bless his infallible word as it is read and declared here today. Let's unite together in prayer momentarily, beloved. And you pray with us. Don't sit there. Don't switch off. It's absolutely essential that the word as it's preached is mixed with faith. You pray for faith as you hear the word. Lord, let that prayer be offered from every heart that thou wilt give faith as the word is heard so that it might profit the soul and do good to each one that thy people may be fed and strengthened and encouraged and counseled and blessed and that those without Christ may be brought to a saving knowledge of him. O oh God, do thy work this day. We lay hold on Christ and all he has promised concerning the Holy Ghost to the church. Blessed Spirit of God, fall on preacher and hearer and do mighty deeds in our hearts and exalt thine own name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What a character was he who became the Apostle Peter. As we follow the record of his life as we're given it in the New Testament, we are as prone, I think, to mourn over him as we are to marvel at him. We see knowledge in his declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, as well as ignorance in trying to stop Jesus from going to the cross. We see faith in his willingness to step out of the boat, as well as unbelief in his beginning to sink. We see courage in his decision to follow Christ into the courtyard of the high priest, as well as fear that will not own Jesus as his master while there. And many more observations could be made as we study his life. He is the epitome of spiritual devotion, wrestling through natural depravity. And with the detail we're given concerning him, We come away not merely with a greater picture of who the man was, but of the grace of God that conquered in his life. But we're going to focus on him 
There is a way of looking at Peter in which you focus primarily upon the triumph of grace and God's mercy. And we will see that, no doubt. But we want to think about Peter, consider him, and observe what the Spirit of God is teaching us concerning him. Because I think we can be comforted as well as challenged by the life of this man. And perhaps even from the outset of this year, we can be praying, Lord, give me something that I see in the life of your servant, Peter. So we're considering Peter, he who was God's apostle to the Jews. He who was God's apostle to the Jews. Note with me, firstly, his conversion. And it's for this reason, primarily, we draw your attention to John chapter 1. We are told from verse 40, if you follow with me, just read three verses here. Verse 40, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him, that is, followed Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. From the rest of the scriptures, we find out that Peter was a fisherman from Galilee, Galilee being that northern region of Israel. But according to Mark's gospel, he had a home in Capernaum, also one of the towns of Galilee, and that's where he lived. You find that in Mark chapter 1. But we're told right here that he wasn't from Capernaum, but according to verse 44, he was from the same city as Philip, the city of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So that's where he originated, which was a city of fishermen. It's really known as that, the house of uh, fishing. And And that's perhaps why he took up that occupation that most men from Bethsaida were fishermen. But he was won to Christ by his brother. That's one of the encouraging things we can note from these opening lines of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as we are brought to see some of these first followers. It is his brother Andrew who lived with him, according to Mark chapter 1, who comes and finds him, who seeks him out. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. He's listening to John the Baptist. John, of course, is the forerunner. He is constantly talking about the one who will come, whose latchets of whose shoes he is not worthy to unloose. And then when Jesus arrives on the scene, he cries out repeatedly, Behold the Lamb of God. And that language in the mind of a Jew like Andrew, and perhaps John was the one that was with him on that occasion, the other disciple, that language was, was significant. It was essentially saying, here is the one that the Passover feast pointed to. Here is God's Paschal Lamb, the one who is the Savior of the world, who will come to be the deliverer of Israel. And so they are pointed to Jesus Christ. They leave John and they begin following Jesus Christ. And as soon as he realizes and he truly believes himself that this man is the Messiah, he has something moving in his heart. He wants to find his brother. And that's what we find then in verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon. There's so much we could just stop there and apply. But suffice to say, beloved, that we are encouraged by Andrew's behavior to see our responsibility to seek those that are near and dear to us. He lived with this man. Not only was his his brother, he lived with him, he worked with him, he meant the world to him. And Andrew has a heart for his brother as soon as he sees the Messiah and believes in him. And he goes after him. There is a pursuit here that goes on. He doesn't just by happen chance bump into his brother. He goes and finds him. He's not just going to wait until he sees him at home. He goes and seeks him out. And that kind of spirit is needed in every day and generation, indeed in our day, that there ought to be this desire to lead people to Jesus Christ. That's what verse 42 so succinctly says. He brought him to Jesus. He can't save him. He can't forgive his sins. He can't change his life. He can't even make him believe. But he can bring him to Jesus. He can bring him to the place where Peter might behold the same truth that had such a changing influence in his own life. This is the kind of heart that we want to have, a heart like Andrew. And I'm going to say from the outset that there won't be any of us that will be like Peter in, in a certain sense. To the degree with which God used him, very unlikely that we will be Peter. Indeed, 
Perhaps there has never been any in the church like Peter with regard to the extent of his influence when he stood up to declare the word of God. But he was won not by a sermon, but by a personal evangelist, by Andrew, his brother, who we find later on in the scriptures also doing the same thing. Remember in John chapter 12, whenever the Greeks come, we would see Jesus. They come and say that to Philip. What does Philip do? Does he go to Jesus? No. He goes and finds Andrew. And Andrew brings the Greeks to Jesus Christ. Or at least that would be what he's endeavored to do, whether or not that actually happened or not. We're not told any detail. But Philip goes to Andrew. And Andrew then is the one that can lead men to Jesus Christ. What a characteristic. And we're not dealing with Andrew, but certainly there is application there for us. But I believe in this passage we have something of the conversion that occurs in the life of Simon Peter. Maybe he's a saved man because we need to be careful when we're dealing with Jews who are living in expectation. Simeon didn't need to be converted whenever the the newborn Jesus Christ comes into the temple on that occasion. Simeon's a converted man. He's a man looking for the Messiah. He is like Abraham looking forward, waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise to his own life that not only would he have a Messiah, but he would see the Lord's Christ was the word that God gave to him. So he's a believing man. And when he sees, he believes. And certainly, certainly it takes a work that is already present in the the heart for one to look at a man who's merely a Jew in the outward form, Jesus Christ, and to see him as the Messiah. Maybe Peter's converted, maybe he's not. We're not told. But we have a conversion at least to his believing that Jesus is the Christ. And that's what happens here. You say, well, how how can you uh, bring that out from verse 42? It doesn't tell us that he believes or anything like that. But look at it. When Jesus beheld him, he looks at Peter, or Simon as he's known here. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Now you see that. Just take a note of that. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want you to know that Jesus Christ looks and he knows everything about you. He knows every last detail of your life. Peter comes to this man who's essentially a stranger, and he's not a a stranger to him. He can't hide anything from him. I know who you are. I know your name. I know your father. I know everything about you. And he says this, Thou shalt be called Cephas. Now, This is where I think we get an indication of the change that occurs within his life and really the converting uh, experience that Peter has at this point. Because for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, when God is dealing with his people in such a way where he gives them a new name is an indication of new prospects. And those new prospects are that which is enjoyed by those who are the people of God. Think of Abraham. He's already a believer, but he's called Abram. And then he is called Abraham. Thou shalt be called Abraham, because thou wilt be a father of many nations. Sarai becomes Sarah. Jacob becomes Israel. And they are markers of something that they can look forward to as the people of God already. And so I think this perhaps we can interpret in the same light. That... Simon here is believing, and the indication of the faith is that the Lord is saying, you will be known as Cephas. There will be a change within your life. This is what the Lord came to do, you see, bring change within the hearts of sinners. Paul writes about it, does he not? In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. Old things pass away, behold, all things are become new. And we have to understand that Christianity, Christianity is a transforming religion. And it is supernatural in its transformation. No man here, no man here, like the leopard, can change his spots. No one. But when Jesus Christ comes along, changes occur. And he indicates that sometimes, such as we have here, and other places that I've mentioned, In the changing of a name, there's a new prospect for you. A prospect of what you can enjoy because you are mine. He was a sinner. (laughs) And you read through the Gospels, that will be beyond shadow of doubt. And yet he is a man transformed by the grace of God. And he is going to learn what it is to follow the Lord. He is converted to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He is going to go after him, seek him, and be with him in the coming days. 
Now, did he get much encouragement from the place where he came from? We sometimes, inevitably it's true that if there is a, a community, a large community that is going in one direction, we're all influenced. We are influenced by what goes on around us, are we not? I've mentioned this as an illustration before, I'll do it again. But it's amazing sometimes when you just think about how you get off an airplane. And you get off the airplane and you don't really look at the signs, you're more looking at where everyone else is going and you're just following them, you follow the crowd. Or if you go into a place, say you go into a little town or a village and you're looking for something to eat and there's two restaurants that are there, two places that sell food and you look at one, you look at the other, one's packed with people, the other one's empty as could be, you're going to think they know something I don't. You're going there. We are, we are influenced by those around us. We are moved by them. And this can happen religiously. If there's a great swelling religious movement, if there's a great revival, there's lots of chaff. Lots of people who are swept up in it just in the emotion of it all. They're not really knowing anything genuine in their hearts. Was that the case for Peter? Was Peter moved along by a great swelling movement of people from his area that loved Jesus Christ? Look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I want you to see this because it's interesting what happens in the ministry of Jesus Christ in the area where Peter was from and lived. Matthew chapter 11 verse 20. Matthew 11 verse 20. Then began he, that's Jesus, to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. So he's bringing judgment upon their heads because they won't repent. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. That's where he's from. That's what we're told in John 1, 44. Peter's from this place. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago on sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. What about the place where he lived? Verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Solemn words. Solemn words indeed. Of course, what the Lord is addressing here is the rank unbelief in those areas. That he goes in there and he performs mighty deeds, mighty miracles. He is exhibiting his Messiahship. He is confirming the prophets. And they won't believe. And that is a warning. The language of warning that he brings, the woe that he brings, is to everyone here who knows the gospel and has ample testimony to their hearts about the truth of God's word and you have yet to be saved. Let me speak to the children. There are children here and you come with your parents, my children, come with us. We're here. You hear the gospel. You know the word of God. You're taught the scriptures. Don't ignore the warning of Jesus Christ in Matthew 11. Is warning those where Jesus comes by and he has done everything to evidence who he is and they won't believe. And young people and children don't be found amongst them. I'm sure you're aware of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sure you're quite aware of God's judgment that came upon the cities of the plain. The fire that came from heaven because of their sin. And Jesus says on the day of judgment, the experience they will have in eternity will be far Worse for those who rejected Jesus Christ and his gospel than for Sodom that had hardly any witness of the truth save Lot in their midst. Such warnings. But the point I'm drawing to your mind is this. That Peter was not encouraged by his community. The town where he was from, Bethsaida, largely didn't believe. The town where he had his home and set up his life, largely didn't believe. Jesus Christ brings strong judgment upon them. And so we are encouraged. We are encouraged by Peter. That if we are going to be Christians, we cannot bargain with God in such a way where we're saying, I will be devoted if everyone else is devoted. If everyone goes with me, then I'll follow. But if I have to follow alone, then you find yourself compromising. 
and toying with religious things. No, beloved, follow Peter. Follow Peter in this. That if you have to walk alone, you walk alone. It doesn't matter what anyone else does, and it doesn't matter who it is. Spouse, children, parents, work colleagues, whatever. Jesus is very plain in his language. He calls disciples of him to be prepared to give up everything to follow him. His conversion. His character. There are things we learn about his character. A few things I want to bring out specifically. First, he was a man of principle. He was a man of principle. If you turn to John chapter 6, and I've turned to this many times, we can turn to other passages, uh, like Matthew 16, we have a different record of the same event. It gives different details, but, but John 6 will serve a helpful, uh, be helpful for us here. John chapter 6, go to the very end of the chapter. Now in John chapter 6, we have John's record of the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle, save his resurrection, it's the only miracle that all four Gospels record. It's very significant. The feeding of the 5,000 is monumental. To the Jew, it is a testimony of what they looked back and they saw their fathers in joy, whereby they wandered through the wilderness and he gave them manna from heaven. And God provided for the multitude, for millions, two million or more, God provided for every day out of heaven. And they looked back and saw God's favor and God's blessing upon them in giving manna from heaven. And so Jesus comes along. The one Moses says would be a greater prophet than he. And he typifies the whole thing. And he feeds a multitude with a few loaves and fish. And he feeds the multitude. What is he saying? Out of nothing as your fathers were fed. So I feed. But there's more to it than the mere physical bread. I am not here merely to satisfy your bellies. That's not my purpose. That's what they came looking for him the next day. They're fed one day. They come after him the next day. And Jesus says, you don't get it. I'm the bread of God sent down from heaven. I am the one who's come to give life unto the world. Multitudes of them. There's thousands of them coming after him. Now, John 6, verse 66. After he teaches the gospel, Jesus preaching. How successful was he as a preacher? (laughs) John 6, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Thousands, thousands of them. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? You picture the scene. They're all Jews there, every last one. They're all Jewish. And the twelve are just another bunch of Jewish men in the midst of thousands of other Jewish men, women and children. Will you also go away? And they watch as the crowd depart. Look at Simon Peter, verse 68. He answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Of course, it's at that point Matthew records, Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You've had a work done in your heart, Peter, that the rest of these thousands have never had done. Uh, and in fact, Jesus talked about that. Did he not? He, 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 he says very clearly, going back to John 6, just to elaborate on this whole idea, let's read from verse 35. John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, to the multitude, that is, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, That ye also have seen me and believe not. So why don't they believe? All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. Verse 39. This is the Father's will which hath sent me that all which which he hath given me I should lose nothing. But should raise it up again at the last day. And so on and so forth. In other words, you bring that language together. He's just preached. What has he said? Those that come to me have been drawn by the Father. And when Peter makes that declaration, he doesn't ascribe it to Peter and say, Peter, you see it, well done for you. He says, flesh and blood hasn't revealed it to you, Peter. But my Father which is in heaven. What does that show us? 
the sovereignty of God in salvation. Oh, start the year, beloved, with a reminder of the fact that the reason you're sitting here and you have any affection for Jesus Christ is not of your own will. You were called into His grace. You were brought, drawn, with that everlasting love of God. A love that was set upon you from eternity past. And He said, He'll be mine. And here you are. Not of your own works. Not of your own seeking. Not of him foreseeing how good you would be or how you would believe, but him saying, he shall be mine. And Peter, he declares it. He's, he doesn't care. There's a work done in his heart. Multitudes turn away, but he stands fast. To whom shall we go? Where else would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Why on earth would we ever leave he was a man of principle. He was a man of humility. There are different ways in which we can look at this in the life of Peter, but one of the signs of humility, one of the signs of humility is seen in how you take rebuke and discipline. It's always a great <laughs> revealer of the heart, rebuke and discipline. And Peter shows humility and abundance in this way. He really does. Solomon warns us, and you read through Solomon, there's so many references to this. Proverbs 15 verse 10. Rebuke a wise man. Or this is Proverbs 9 verse 8 rather. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Rebuke him and he will love thee. Ever been rebuked and hated someone for it? It's a sign you're a fool. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Proverbs 15 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. Those that hate reproof. They're on the path of death and destruction. The one who feels correction to be grievous is forsaking the way. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, rebuke and discipline, as I said already, is a wonderful revealer of the heart. If someone loves the Lord and loves the Lord's people and loves the things of God, only insofar as everything is positive and encouraging and always in their favor. And as soon as someone comes, like a preacher, and points out their sin, not deliberately looking at them, but preaching the word of God, which is the revealer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And they get offended by it. They get offended and they don't like it. It's a real revealer of the heart. Peter is rebuked on a couple of occasions by the Lord. <laughs> One of them in John 13, when he's washing the disciples' feet. And Peter saith unto the Lord, Thou shalt never wash my feet. How could you be the servant and I be the one served? You'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. You don't belong to me. <laughs> That's a rebuke. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You're well, Lord. You're well. Also, also Matthew 16. We'll maybe turn to it so you're reminded of it. Matthew 16. Verse 21. Try to imagine yourself in the scene now. Just don't read over it and kind of think nothing about it. Try to see yourself here. Hear this language spoken directly to you. Imagine someone said this to your face. Matthew 16 verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus, and this is just after the passage of John 6 we were looking at a moment ago. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go on to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Does the Lord turn around and say, Ah, oh, Peter, you misunderstand. Try to hear these words as directed to you. He turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Isn't that amazing? This happens just on the back, roughly around the same time. As his great declaration, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he turns around and the Lord begins to teach, well, 
The Christ, the Christ must go to the cross. It's prophesied that he must suffer, he must die. His visage will be marred more than that of any man. And as he begins to preach those things, Peter comes and says, Can't, it won't happen. I'll not let it happen. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Yes, he gave him a name. He'll be called Cephas. Now he gives him a different name. Satan. Satan. Can you imagine how you would respond to that? I know how most would respond. At least I'm inclined to think how most would respond. Put yourself in the position. You've left everything to follow this man who you believe to be the Christ. You've declared it to be so. But I think most people have a certain tipping point where they would just not take anymore. I don't have to take this kind of nonsense. I don't have to take this kind of treatment. Well, certainly that would be the, <laughs> with the snowflake age in which we live in, that would be the response. We'd all wilt and run away. But not Peter. He carries on. He carries on. What a man of humility, I tell you. But not just Jesus. In Galatians chapter 2, we are told of an occasion whenever certain Jews came down to Antioch and Peter's there and when the Jews are there Peter begins to change his behaviour <laughs> and he won't sit with the Gentiles and eat with them and Paul's there and it tells us that Paul withstood him to the face publicly because he was to be blamed in front of everyone Peter you're wrong and how did Peter take it? Did he hold a grudge? Get all upset. Well, it doesn't tell us in the context, but later on in 2 Peter chapter 3, he refers to Paul as our beloved brother, Paul. Beloved brother. Is that how you see a brother who rebukes you? Is that how you see the preacher who comes and brings the word that cuts into your heart, the quick of your being? Beloved brother. He was humble. Such a revelation of the humility of his heart. He was also a man of passion. He was a man of passion. That is really one of the standout characteristics of him. And I'm not going to turn to it now because I'll turn to it in just a moment. But he makes a confession in John 21. Thou knowest that I love thee. He says it three times. And he declares it. He declares his love for Christ. That confession shows the passion of his heart. He's not just talking in terms whereby he refers, I'm your follower or whatever. Uh, or I've some other kind of staid terms. He's talking in terms of passion. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And you know what? His heart was moved after the Lord. Not only his confession, but his contrition, I think, shows it as well. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And one of the things I have learned here since I've come, and maybe if I was in ministry in Northern Ireland, I would see the same. But certainly, you get lessons at times, and you realize that what you thought was taken for granted shouldn't be taken for granted. The idea that the Christian confesses their sin seems not to be so widely understood since I've started pastoring here as I thought it might be. I always thought Christians knew that they should confess their sins every day. But the questions have, been, have arose on, by different people in different times. This idea, do we need to confess our sins? Or why, do, why is there always this confession of sin? And what's the focus on confession of sin? And as if, as if it's something, you know, we're all forgiven, are we not? Is it not all kind of, you know, done and dusted and we're Christians now and we don't have to deal with all of that sin? Well, well hang on a minute. <laughs> do you need bread daily to live, do you? Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. After this manner we are to pray. Forgive us our trespasses. As regularly as the bread. That God gives to us in our tables. Forgive us our trespasses. We are a people marked by our penitence. As I have said to you before. Last year. Some of us thought about and considered. And were thankful for 500 years since the Protestant Reformation. It did a lot of good. Tremendous good. We have many liberties today because of it. And when Luther drew up his 95 Theses and the issues that he had with the church at that time, he puts at the head of them this idea that militated against what the Church of Rome taught. 
The Christian life is a life of repentance. And to this day, people still militate against it, even if they're not Roman Catholic. Militate against the idea that the Christian life is, oh, that's sordid and, you know, Jesus has done it. Yes, he has. Forgive us our debts, Lord. So we forgive those in debt to us. There has to be that. And there has to be contrition over sin. There has to be. If there's no contrition over sin, it's because you don't know the weight of it. And you don't comprehend the sufferings of Christ. And you have no sense of what Christ endured on your behalf. And you're not ashamed. Your sin put the Son of God on the cross. But Peter, Peter was moved. Luke 22, verse 55. He is, let's read from verse 54, in fact. Luke 22, verse 54. Then they took Jesus and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. Oh, he's following. But there's problems in his following. This becomes more manifest. You know, maybe that marks 2017 for you. You followed the Lord. You didn't get completely off course. But you were following afar off. Truth be told, you were following at a distance. Verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. That's all he did. Just looked at him. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. You get that. Peter's passion, love for Jesus Christ is seen in his immediate repentance and the depth of his feeling about what he has done. He doesn't need the Lord to actually say or remind him. He remembers the word and he ties it in what the Lord said with his own actions and he doesn't begin to, do, oh, but, oh, but. That's what some people do. You point out their sin. The Lord addresses certain matters or you deal with them. And you say, this is not becoming of the Christian. You need to get rid of this thing in your life. Maybe the Lord has done that in your life. He has pointed out things. In the past year, he's put his finger on things several times. He's made you aware of things that you ought not to have in your life. And you ignored it. Peter didn't. He didn't start coming up with the ifs and buts. He just weeps bitterly. When was the last time you wept bitterly over your own sin? Oh, it doesn't save. Don't get me wrong. It's not justifying. It doesn't make you more right before God. It certainly shows some sort of deep understanding of what Christ did to save you and of your obligation to Him as His disciple. His confession proves His passion. His contrition proves it as well. His courage also proves it. I'll not turn to this, but the courage that He had Acts chapter 2, this is a man, we see him here, 
Luke 22. <laughs> There's a handful of people there and he denies the Lord. Then he gets up before a whole multitude, a whole thousands of his fellow Jewish countrymen and proselytes. And he gets up before them and he begins to preach fearlessly. And it's not some kind of washy message of the gospel. He kind of just touches on things concerning the fact that Jesus was Messiah. He gets right to the quick of the issue. Whom ye crucified, he says. You killed him, the Lord of glory. Oh, they can have his head right there. And he stands up and he preaches. And then the Sanhedrin as well. He stands before them. By what means is the impotent, was the impotent man made whole? How, how, how does he walk? By what power, by what name hath he done this? And he owns it. <laughs> he owns the Lord before them. Courage. Courage. Courage is important, you know. Courage is so vital. Without courage, all your other virtues are hidden. It's so essential that we be people of courage in a day whenever the world is trying to make you afraid to own Christ. You have to have courage. Without getting sidetracked, if you feel a weakness in that area, you need a fresh and filling of the Spirit. Because if the Spirit did anything in the lives of men and women in the New Testament or in this day and generation, the Spirit brings courage, boldness to speak for Christ. Finally, his commission. See his commission. We'll go to John 21 because it's here where we see really him commissioned to the work. Now, it's not the beginning of it. The Lord comes along, he, he believes the Lord is the Messiah. And then there comes a time when the Lord calls him to be a disciple of his and to follow him. We find that recorded in Mark 1, verses 16 and 3, 18. I'll just read it to you. Mark 1, verse 16. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And I was struck by that, the immediacy of their obedience. They're not turning around thinking, well, hang on here, you know, I run a business here. The Lord calls and they go. If the Lord calls you to some sort of service or ministry, when you hear his word, you go. When you know beyond shadow of doubt that he has spoken to your heart, if in doubt, if it's not clear, don't move. But at the same time, if he has been clear, and then you start asking for signs, and for other fleeces, and all this kind of thing, the Lord's spoken, he's saying, follow me in this matter. And you go, well, give me another sign. No sign may be given you. And you will stand by those nets for years, waiting for another sign. When the Lord gave you one clear command, follow me, follow me. Obey his word. Do not mess around with God's call to serve in any capacity. For the next three and a half years or so, this fisherman of Galilee devotes himself to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as we've seen, he is not half-hearted about it at all. And there's no doubt we can see much about his character, his impulsiveness and so on. But we bring you, as we're drawing to a close here today to John 21 because here is a man whom the Lord is going to use mightily and he is going to affirm to him his commission what he has called him to do John 21 verse 15 so when they had dined Jesus saith to Simon Peter Simon son of Jonas lovest thou me more than these now there's debate about what the these are most likely it's the 153 fish that had been gathered in and Something challenging like, what do you love, Peter? Do you love the old, the old life? Because that's, that's what he did when he was waiting for the Lord. He got fed up waiting. Verse 3 in the same chapter, if you go back, as Simon Peter said unto them, I go a-fishing. I'm going. I can't stand around and sit here any longer. I'm away fishing. I'm going back to the old occupation. Oh, dangerous. <laughs> Very dangerous. The Lord graciously calls him. 
back to the shore. And he challenges him, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Your love needs to be seen in some kind of service. For Peter, it was feeding. Feeding the souls of men. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Was the Lord clear in what he wanted him to do? Absolutely. Crystal clear. Peter, feed the flock of God over which I have made you an overseer. Feed them. Everyone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ has some form of service. They have. We're not all called to feed the sheep and feed the lambs. He gives some apostles, some teachers and pastors. That's his prerogative to dish out gifts to the church. But dish them out, he does. We all have gifts. And from the outset of this year, Peter was gifted to do what? I'll make you a fisher of men. And I'm preparing you to feed sheep. You're a fisherman. I'm going to make you to know not only how to fish for men, but how to shepherd men as well. He gifted them. What has God gifted you in? Really? What are you doing for the kingdom? What did you do in 2017 for the kingdom of Christ? You have to find your calling, beloved. And you need to find a way of exercising it. In the body, outside the body, in some way, you need to find a way of exercising it. Let's tie this up. There's no doubt Peter had zeal. A zeal that was perhaps incomparable to anyone else. It's funny how you see him in, in, in different things as well. How that zeal, what that zeal causes him to do. To walk on water, for example. <laughs> he just jumps out. And the rest are all standing there. He, he jumps out. I mean, that zeal. That's, 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 there's something there that most people don't have. Jumps out. The Lord's there. I'd rather be near the Lord. Jumps out onto the water. Or when they come to arrest the Lord, they're all standing there. What does Peter do? He pulls out the sword, takes off Malchus' ear. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a man of zeal. Don't you touch my Lord! He's standing there before hundreds of men. Hundreds of men. He pulls out the sword, ready to <laughs> on guard with them all. <laughs> There's zeal in his heart. But in everything we learn about him, it is the grace of Christ that stands out, beloved. After denying him three times with oaths and cursings, and there probably is a link there in the Lord affirming him and his commission three times again with his thrice denial. But we might look at that denial and we would say, there's no future for such a man. How could there be? How could there be a future for such a man who denies the Lord in such a way where elsewhere we're told it's with oaths and with cursings? And I imagine that as he wept, can you imagine him weeping there in the court as he ran away from the court that time? Can you imagine him? I think he's imagining it's over for me. It's over. I've just denied the Lord in the way I said I wouldn't. How could he ever use me? And I can see Peter in his mind separating himself from the rest of the disciples thinking the rest of you ran away but you didn't deny the Lord when you were outright asked are you one of them I can see him withdrawing and that is why when the women come on the resurrection morning when they gather and the tomb is empty and there's an angel there and he gives command to them go and tell the disciples and 
Peter also. Go and tell the disciples. And, well, hang on, was Peter not one of the disciples? Yes, he was. But I can just see it in everyone's mind, not just Peter, but in the disciples and in the women. Peter's denied the Lord three times. Maybe he's cut off. Maybe he's set apart. Maybe he's no longer in the Lord's plans. And the Lord said, you go and tell the disciples, and make sure you tell Peter that I will meet with them in Galilee as I said unto them. Such grace. The Lord's long-suffering with his people. And maybe, maybe 2017, you look back on it and you say, that was a year of denying the Lord. That was a year of denying the Lord. A year where I did not live for the Lord the way I ought. Now, to own it, up, own it in your own heart, beloved, whether the year was any way of, a year of fidelity to Christ or denial of him. Because as you own it, then you can be, hear the words ringing in your ear. I still will come to you. <laughs> I still have a purpose for you. You're not set in a shelf. As long as you breathe on this earth, I have a reason for you breathing. How is your zeal, Christian? How is your service? Peter went on to be the great apostle to the Jews. And how is your service for Christ? What are you doing? What treasure are you laying up in heaven these days? As your zeal is, so is your love. My zeal is often an indicator of my love. Often. Spurgeon, we'll end with the Baptist. Love to Jesus is the basis of all true piety. And the intensity of this love will ever be the measure of our zeal for his glory. How much I love him will be reflected in my zeal. I can't measure my love. But it might be a bit easier to measure my zeal. And that tells me about my love. Praise the Lord for his grace. Let's bow together in prayer.